Coming up, the Tunica Biloxi tribe gets control of the Marksville Historic State Park, which has special meaning to the tribe. Plus, a Potawatomi biologist is one of this year's MacArthur Fellows, which is also known as the Genius Award. And we'll check out the new NBA uniforms that pay tribute to all 22 tribes in Arizona. I'm Mackenzie Allen Charmley. Join us for those interviews from the ICT Newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Arizona is home to 22 tribal nations and more than 340,000 Native Americans. Arizona State University builds on more than six decades of working and partnering with tribal nations and communities. Many of our Native faculty incorporate indigenous knowledge systems in seeking solutions through a process of community engagement that respects and honors traditional ways of thinking. Together, we are creating community solutions leading to a more equitable future. This is the ICT Newscast with Aliyah Chavez. Chenangale, we're so happy you could join us. During this holiday time, we are bringing you some interviews that touch on indigenous history and more. We began with a tribe in Louisiana. In the late 1700s, the Tunica Biloxi tribe first settled in what became the Mississippi Valley. According to the tribe, their people were skilled traders and entrepreneurs. And while they've been in the area for centuries, they didn't get federal recognition until 1981. Today, there are about 1,500 citizens. For years, tribal leaders tried to get ownership of the Marksville Historic State Park, a place that is home to burial sites. Just last month, their efforts came to fruition. Marshall Perit, the chairman of the Tunica Biloxi Tribe of Louisiana, tells us more about the land. It consists of 42 acres. It's part of our ancestral homelands. Uh, we were great stewards. Our ancestors were stewards over the land, and we are delighted and overjoyed that Tunica Biloxi once again is the rightful owner of these uh, burial grounds, uh, our sacred grounds, because it means so much to us. Tell our viewers at home the process and the journey that it took to get to this place. Well, the journey actually started in the early 80s once we was uh, federal recognized by the late Chairman O.J. Barber Sr. approaching then Governor uh, Dave Treen about transferring the property. And um, that process has been undergone through every one of his administration. Then it was picked up by Chairman uh, Joy Paul Barbary. And finally, uh, during this administration, we regain ownership of the property. And we are grateful um, to the city of Marksville, the state of Louisiana, but most importantly to the mayor, Lamo John Lamont, and the council members for utilizing all three components of vision, uh, hindsight, insight, and foresight, recognizing the value of, and the cultural value of what the property meant to Tunica Biloxi Tribe of Louisiana. Let's actually talk about what ultimately spurred the city to transfer this land back. What happened there? Well, one of the things, they went into a budget crisis. Uh, they, didn't, they couldn't afford to the upkeep and maintenance of the property. So um, this started a conversation really heated up about two years ago and to see if we'd be willing to take it on when we was excited uh, and said, yes, this has been an ongoing battle for over uh, 40 years. We would love our ancestral property back for us to uh, create a revitalization program as well as a beautification program. And most importantly, um, to rededicate that land um, uh, and rededicate it to a way where we recognize it uh, today significance of the place of grace because again so many of our ancestors their final resting place is there and what is also there is stories that was never told 
relationships that was never formed, um, opportunities that never came to realization because all of those things was taken away from our ancestors because of the battles or storms or the injustice by the system or by the um, population at that time. So um, we just, again, overjoy that the property is in our, um, back in our hands where we can take care of it and create a, a memory, um, a memorial there as well as for the grandchildren, great-grandchildren to enjoy the property as um, our ancestors should have had the opportunity to enjoy it. Chairman, I'm wondering if you can speak to what the reaction has been from non-Native people who live in the city or who live in the area and are maybe learning about this for the first time. What has been their reaction? Well, their reaction was very positive because they've been all along cheering on the process, saying that the land should be donated back to Tuna Kovalexi because this is our rightful and um, property, our ancestral lands. They understand the cultural value of it. And so um, the significant value. So they, re they really cheered on the process and it was very encouraging throughout the process. You know, every time we have tribal leaders on to talk about land back victories, I always ask them to comment on, um, you know, other tribes who are going through this process and might feel discouraged or feel like there's so much that they have to go through. If you were speaking to tribal leaders doing this work, what would you say to them? I would tell them never give up. Keep on the good fight of fate and also remember why you're doing it. And it's not be only because it's a piece of property. It's because of the sacrifices that our ancestors went through. And those sacrifices cannot compare in the sacrifices that we have today. They sacrifice blood, sweat, and tears. And uh, because of the injustices that they had to go through. So continue that fight. And um, and our hope and prayers is going to be with each and every one until um, you get your uh, ownership of your uh, of your land. And uh, don't get discouraged. Uh, get it one acre as, at a time, uh, like Tunica Biloxi did. We made sure we fought the good battle of fate day after day. And um, it was a very... Um, great experience. And again, we thrilled and overjoyed to have our property back. Each year, the MacArthur Foundation honors a new class of fellows. This year, Robin Wall Kimmerer was among the prestigious class. She is citizen Potawatomi and the author of Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teaching of Plants. As part of the honor, Kimmerer will also receive $800,000 in award money. Sandra Shulman has this interview. So you have won this, one of the winners of the MacArthur Fellowship for this year, which is a very big deal, and you're one of the Native winners. Uh, you have a bit of an unusual um, arts background. I don't know. I guess it's an art what you do. So tell us a little bit about uh, how you work with, with Native plants and, and what you do. Yeah, I'm a plant ecologist. I'm a professor of botany, um, and I'm really interested in protection of our cultural plants and what I call biocultural restoration of both protecting our plants, healing the land, and really trying to think about the intersection between culture, traditional knowledge, and Western science and bringing all those together in order to protect uh, indigenous homelands and landscapes. So how does that actually translate into action? Do you go to reservations and and work with the tribes on this knowledge? Well, it, it all depends on, on the project. I would say that for, I live here in Haudenosaunee territory. Um, I am citizen Potawatomi, but this is where, I, where I'm based. 
And working here in Haudenosaunee territory, we're working with restoration of cultural plants like ooh, the medicine that community is really interested in and in um, trying to devise ways to reintroduce those plants um, to indigenous homelands. We're, we're also really interested in, of course, in rematriation of land with, and, and land justice. Our Center for Native Peoples and the Environment is is dedicated to the to the work of land justice, of improving and creating more access for um, indigenous communities to both public and, and private lands for the ability to um, gather basket plants, medicine plants, etc. So yeah, it has both um, very tangible on the ground um, work as well as work with our students and and research in and how to think about this and devise these strategies. I understand you're writing a book and you're going to use some of this funding for time you said to write and to think, which is a big part of writing a book, I know. So what will the book be on? Well, this book is really grounded in a cultural understanding of plants as persons, plants as our teachers, plants as, 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 as knowledge holders in a way. and so I'm trying to write from Anishinaabe perspective about some of our most important plants who are storytellers and who appear in so many of our traditional stories and who are also really important as scientific markers of environmental change. So I'm, this, this book, which I'm so delighted to have more time to really think about and, and dig into, is, is grounded in, in the personhood of one of our, our cultural icons, icons uh, Jingwak, the, the white pine. And you know, I really hope that at the end of this book, there the, the notion of the rights of nature and the personhood and intelligence of nature becomes um, much easier for the publish for the public to grasp through um, the, the work of story. Well, it's very important work and we look forward to the book and thank you so much for your time. Thanks. Up next, what is it like to compete in the Miss USA pageant? We'll find out from Sanoa LaRock and later a look at the uniforms the Phoenix Suns are now wearing that honor all 22 tribes in Arizona. We'll be right back. Sanoa LaRock was crowned Miss North Dakota USA earlier this year. During her reign, the Harvard University graduate has represented her state and tribal nation on some pretty big stages. She also competed in the Miss USA pageant. And while she didn't win the title, she tells us what it was like competing in the Miss USA pageant. It was very surreal to be on that national stage and to be representing my home state of North Dakota. It was something that you know, really humbled me. Um, and not just because I get to represent North Dakota, but also because I got to represent Indian country as well. And so um, it was just something, you know, every moment kind of felt like a dream. And I was very honored to have the opportunity to share um, with the other title holders aspects of our native culture and um, things about my home state of North Dakota as well. I understand that this competition actually takes place in a, in a series of um, different events. Maybe tell mm -hmm. us what those events were um, and you know what you were most excited for. Yeah, so the Miss USA uh, pageant is equally weighted in three categories. So one third of your score is in evening gown, one third of your score is in swimwear, and one third of your score is in interview. For me, uh, I personally lo love interview. I feel that I, I, I really shine in, in, those, in those settings. And so I was really uh, excited to have that personal interview with the judges. Um, but of course, I was also really looking forward to evening gown. Uh, going to Miss USA, I actually had the opportunity to design my evening gown and I made sure to incorporate Ojibwe, Ojibwe motifs into the, the design of my gown. And so I was really excited to share that on stage as well. 
How do you prepare for something like this? I mean, the, the swimwear competition, obviously it sounds like, you know, you do some yoga or something really fun <laughs> like that. But for um, the interview and the evening gown part of it, how do you prepare for something like that? Yeah. So like you had mentioned, um, fitness is a big part of it. And fitness is always something that's kind of been a big part of my life anyway. So that was kind of easy to keep up with that routine. Um, as far as the other aspects of competition uh, interview, for example, I would meet with different mentors or coaches and just kind of, you know, go through questions and try to come up with things off the cuff in a way that sounded eloquent. Um, and then, you know, the other aspects of competition putting on heels and walking around my living room and trying to <laughs> look graceful. Um, one thing at Miss USA this year is they had stairs as part of the the stage. Um, and so trying to make sure that that looked as as good as I could make it look was part of my preparation there. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about how you integrated, you know, being Anishinaabe into every part of your competition. I, I saw that you um, danced on stage, but why was that important to you to do that? Yeah. Uh, so I, um, you know, every day that I was there, I tried to wear different beaded earrings or quilled earrings or uh, just different kinds of things that represented, you know, contemporary Native culture and things that are important to us. That way I could have those teaching moments with the Miss USA staff and the other title holders. And then, of course, um, Miss USA has a costume show, which I know, you know, as Native people, we don't refer to our regalia as costumes. However, I thought this was such a good opportunity to be able to share that aspect of our culture and, and you know what it means to be a contemporary indigenous woman in this world and so um, I was able to tie in you know the teachings of the jingle dress um, you know how it relates to um, the population the native population in North Dakota being one of the only states that has a high Native American population um, the Cookham scars which are representative of you know Ukrainian uh, immigrants in in the United States and being able to kind of share that narrative on that stage. Um, and then, of course, dancing on stage was a really, really powerful moment, I think. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure that I had that opportunity to teach others about, you know, who we are in, in, in the modern world and um, kind of just where I come from. I've been a jingle dress dancer since I was two years old. And so it's something that's very near and dear to my heart. And so it was important to be able to, to have that representation on stage. I was watching a video when I was preparing for this interview, and it was actually of your interview for Miss USA, and you talked mm -hmm. about wanting to inspire uh, Native children who maybe don't mm -hmm. think that Miss USA is something that they could be. You know, mm -hmm. if there was a young child watching this interview and you had a message for them, what would it be? Yeah, and so part of my whole platform with this is that I'm somebody, you know, I was born on the reservation to a single mother. I didn't really have a relationship with my dad growing up. Um, we kind of grew up in poverty and eventually, you know, I was exposed to things like abuse and addiction in, in, in a way that many Native kids I think are familiar with. And um, eventually my grandparents took me in and I was raised by them, which I think is <laughs> rings true for a lot of Native kids. Um, and so my, my, my message here is that, you know, there's always hope. The grass is greener on the other side. I was able to persevere through my personal struggles and um, go to college. I attended Harvard and eventually become Miss North Dakota USA. And so um, really for me, having strong mentors and having the the knowledge that, you know, there are opportunities out there and I am able to succeed despite the odds um, kind of made all the difference. And so if I can be a mentor in, in a native kid's life that I would, you know, I want to capitalize on that, of course. And um, so the message, I guess, is just, you know, keep pushing. There, the grass is greener on the other side, and there's always there's always something out there for everybody. Sonoa LaRock will continue her reign as Miss North Dakota until May of next year. We'll be right back with a look at the new Phoenix Suns jersey that pays tribute to tribes. Phoenix Suns are wearing a unique jersey this season that honors the 22 tribal nations in Arizona. ICT's Patty Talahongva and Max Montour got an exclusive look when the players saw the jerseys for the first time in October. Oh, they're pretty. They're very pretty. One by one, the Phoenix Suns players held up the turquoise jersey and the bonus, a beaded Suns medallion. 
Stephen Lewis, the governor from the Gila River Indian community, spoke to the team and promptly nicknamed the jersey. Uh, the city edition, I would call it the tribal edition, right, or the res edition, that is very special. This season, each NBA team is unveiling a jersey that's unique to the city where they play. This city edition jersey can also divert from the team's official colors. Suns management, led by Sean Martinez, the senior director of live presentation, spent more than two years consulting with the Intertribal Council of Arizona, Nike's N7 program, and more Native groups in Phoenix to come up with the design. Governor Lewis gave them a little history at the unveiling. This land, even here, uh, underneath uh, the beautiful Footprint Center, all of Phoenix was our traditional land. Martinez explained the significance of turquoise, saying it offers protection. Along the sides of the uniform is the word sun in all 22 languages. Governor Lewis thanked the Suns organization for working with tribal leaders on this unique jersey. I really appreciate the Phoenix Suns going above and beyond. And they wanted to do this right. And, you know, instead of doing it without any tribal input, you know, they, they came to, to the, the experts who are the tribes themselves. I think the design catches your eye enough that you're going to be like, what, what's the meaning behind that? And I think it'll drum up some noise on that end. After the presentation, the players suited up in their new jerseys for a promotional photo and video shoot with some special guests. 22 youth representing each tribe stood in awe as the players walked towards them. I'm re representing uh, Hopi. When I was getting ready, it felt good to get back uh, into the traditional clothes again. Uh, when the players came out, uh, I kind of got nervous. I was happy to see them. It was a bit like herding cats to get this group ready for the photo shoot. My title is where I represent the little kids in my tribe. I get to meet the basketball players. And every time I met, every time I took pictures with them, I felt so tiny beside them because they're taller than me. I had one girl sitting next to me during the photo shoot and she was talking the whole time, giggling, um, even during serious pictures. I'm like, you gotta stop giggling. But she was showing me her shoes, her moccasins. She was showing me her buckskin bag with the bells on it. Um, and she had on two bracelets and maybe three rings, all of them turquoise for protection, like the jersey. We talked about um, why am I wearing this and what's, um, and what's this called and why am I wearing a camp dress and what's, what's mostly what my outfit called and why am I wearing it. She said her favorite part was her bag, it was her mom's. The little tie-in loop was an elk tooth and she said that's her lucky charm, so that was pretty cool. It was both exciting and emotional, says Martinez. The kids, as we were taking the picture, I could feel the energy of the 22 youth that were standing there, and I almost started crying, but I held it in. I talked to Toy Craig. I was asking him about his season and how he's gonna improve this year. Then I took pictures with DeAndre Ayton, Devin Booker, um, Toy Craig, Cameron Payne, the feeling I felt was like super exciting because usually I'm just like in the stands watching the games, but like I actually got to like be on the court and experience it. it was awesome. I talked to Payne, Cam, Booker, and AD. And what did they say to you? Did they? Ask oh, I also talked to the coach. Um, he was saying that he had he was asking what sports I play, where I'm from, how is it like there. The youth also offered lessons on how to say the word sun in their language. Apache language, and the way how I'm saying it is Jana'ai. That's the way how you say um, sun in Apache. We say sun in Hopi, um, like Dawa. And it's on the court too. Yeah, okay. and then it's on their jerseys too on the side. Center court is decked out with the medicine wheel design and a turquoise accent surrounds the baskets. I don't think the native presence here is, is talked about enough, looked at enough, helped enough. So I think that's, uh, I think this is a good place for us to start right now. The whole country will not only see the new uniforms, they'll learn about the tribes in Arizona. 
The players will also wear the uniform seven times on the road. We intentionally targeted markets that have large indigenous populations like Oklahoma City, Minneapolis, Toronto, all their games are on TSN so all of Canada can get a chance to see this gorgeous uniform and uh, really make sure that we're showing up across the country for indigenous communities. And they'll wear the uniform 10 times at home games as they honor the tribes throughout the season. The celebration, Originative, is being hosted by Gila River Resorts and Casino and kicks off during Native American Heritage Month. It's unbelievable. It's something that I could never dream. Growing up in Fort Defiance on the Navajo Reservation, saying, wow, I'm with the Suns and they're wearing a Native American jersey. Um, I hope it shows that we, we see them and we care about them and we want to honor them and we want to give them hope. We want to give them uh, motivation and you know whatever else we can for them to achieve their goals. In Phoenix, Patty Thalahungva, ICT News. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. Sometimes you got to take a stand Just because you know you can oh, You got to run, you got to run The Sand Creek Massacre, the betrayal that changed Cheyenne and Arapaho people forever, focuses on tribal accounts of Colorado's deadliest day. Exhibition details at HistoryColoradoCenter.org. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.